Welcome to the Soothsight podcast. My guest today is John Kish. John recently took on the role of CIO at the financial services company Equity Trust. Prior to that, he was the CIO of Medical Mutual, a multi-billion dollar health insurance company, and at Safe Auto, a major PNC insurer. He has also held various leadership roles at organizations such as Progressive and was also a partner at Accenture. John holds a bachelor's in computer science from The Ohio State University and an MBA with honors from the top-ranked University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I have had the pleasure of being friends and collaborating with John for several years now, and he is the epitome of what it means to be a leader, both in technology and more broadly. He is the rare CIO that is equally adept at communicating with both the business and with technical practitioners. I also appreciate that even though he has been in leadership for decades, he remains hands-on with coding. John, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. It's going to be fun. Absolutely. Go box, right? <laughs> exactly. Ohio State yes. University. <laughs> so William Edwards Deming said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. How do you decide what data to collect as an organization, and how do you go about vetting data science projects? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, it's funny. I thought the saying was, "In God we trust, all others pay cash," but but okay. And uh, I, I think the first thing is, you know, just start by not throwing anything away, right? I think there's so much information that hits organizations, and um, it, it it just gets thrown away sometimes. You know, it just isn't collected or captured anywhere. The second piece would be work really hard to um, penetrate the data silos that exist in the company, N not only so that things don't get thrown away, but so you just know what um, you know, information might be out there that might be helpful. And then, and then third, and I think this is where a lot of companies could probably do something pretty quickly, would be just making sure you have a good change engine. Um, I think as data changes over time, like transactional data is pretty simple, but I think there could be slower moving um, slower velocity master data that does change slowly over time. And those changes are kind of important and capturing those changes are important. So um, that's how I think about it. So how do you go about working with other C-suite executives to align data and analytics initiatives with business goals and strategies? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think it's just a hand in hand collaboration. I think it's just good old fashioned hard work. Um, you know, starting with making sure you've got a solid problem definition. I think that's where um, a lot of folks don't spend the time they need to spend on defining the problem. Uh, maybe it gets defined too small. Maybe you start solutioning before you really understand the problem. Um, and I think really thinking about how can my solution hit, you know, three or four key strategic objectives, not just one or two tactical objectives. I think the, you know, the, I always like this saying, you know, take a step back. And I think, um, you know, solutioning and problem definition really requires people to take multiple steps back to do it well. And on the other side of the coin, then, how do you collaborate with the practitioners, the, the data scientists and engineers? How do you ensure that these initiatives address the actual business objectives? Yeah, I think I think the the most important thing there is really explaining why and and trying to help people understand why to me is is an exercise of writing things down trying to simplify things trying to make sure that you've got clear connective tissue between your your major strategic objectives kind of the category of thing that fits into and then how you're going to you know sort of achieve it and i think um as an example i would say you know one of the things i've been working on lately is you know how do we grow sales how do we grow revenue and, and oddly, one of the things I think of as going underneath that bucket is security, because if, if you don't have a decent security program, if you don't have um, strong, strong security, you risk brand reputation. And, and therefore, I tie security more to a revenue goal than I do to sort of an independent security goal. And then I think about things like, you know, vulnerabilities and, and those types of things that, that would dive more into the analytical side. Um, as supporting that security goal, but that would just be one example. 
So then how do you go about measuring the success of these data science projects, these analytics projects within the organization? And how do you evaluate their impact on the business? I'm, I'm sure you can't get into specific ROIs, but broadly speaking. Yeah, broad, broadly speaking, I think if you if you can think about your strategic goals um, as sort of the outcomes you want to achieve, and then and then I think, and this should resonate with a lot of people, is you know there's sort of a next level of goal, which is more of an output. It's something that that is a little more tangible, sort of a direct lever you can get a hold of. And I think um, I think making sure that you are tying the things you're doing in whatever the data science project is to those outputs very clearly um, because we don't always you know we don't always control the outcome right like we don't always have direct control of the outcomes but we ought to be really focused on the things we're doing are going to really make a difference to those outputs we're trying to get to and and then that's where you know a little bit of the magic happens in terms of trying to you know synchronize how the outputs then drive the outcomes what challenges have you encountered in, in implementing these data science initiatives in your career and, and how have you addressed them? And, and, and maybe don't answer this question, but if you want, are there any unique challenges, let's say within insurance or financial services where there's a lot of concern for protecting personally identifiable information? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll just I'll handle that question in reverse. I think PII is always a challenge. PCI is always a challenge. Um, I think the patterns are getting better out there on how to deal with it, you know, just sort of strategies around, um, you know, making sure that data doesn't proliferate throughout the organization, kind of getting it under lock and key, um, you know, really understanding data classification and categorization and, and um, levels of access for data. So I think those strategies are pretty well known and, and reasonably well adopted by companies. And if, if your company doesn't have one of those, you, you probably need to start thinking about it immediately. Um, so I think I think that's how I think about that kind of thing. How do you foster a culture of innovation and in, in technology within your uh, the adoption of technology within your companies? Yeah, you, you know it's a it's a great question. I I think there's a lot of different ways to accomplish that. I mean I've seen a lot of different um, um, you know sort of tacks at that over my career. Um, I've seen people stand up labs. Um, I've seen people support, um, you know, different training exercises, different experimentation. Um, but I think I think what it really gets down to is, you know, I think most people in the computer science realm are fundamentally problem solvers. And, and so, you know, I think part of it starts with just having a good problem to solve. I mean, I think about the reason I still write a little code from time to time. It's usually because I'm trying to solve some problem or I'm trying to prototype something out or I have an idea that I just want to see if it's it's reasonable. I'm, I don't want anybody to think I'm writing production level code at any time. It's not. But I think being a little hands on with some of these open source and free tools allows you to get a feel for what the people are dealing with. Um, who are dealing with production level, um, you know, problems. Data is messy. Um, data can be incomplete. Data can be a lot of different things. So I think that is um, extremely challenging to deal with. And just having a little bit of a feel for that is great for people. And then I think as a as a leader and as a manager, it really gets down to carving out time for people. You know, I think I think um, you know I think Agile's got a lot of pluses. But one of the minuses, we are, you know, always in sprints. We're always driving for that next release of functionality. And, and if you soak up everyone's time doing that, which is a good thing, I think you're missing some opportunity to have people be a little creative and, and think about the application of new technology and give people permission to do that, um, which is really a big part of it, just finding that time. Yeah, you were touching on it. So then how do you balance the need for rapid innovation with the, the need to also maintain legacy systems and, and infrastructure? Yeah, it's I, I mean, that is like the hardest question, I think, for most people in a in a CIO or CTO or, or really anybody near or around technology. Um, you know, I think you've got to push on the innovation side. And, and I think as you think about your legacy environment, what I tend to think about is how do you clean up the things that matter, and I think in financial services, um, what matters is the data. So you have to, you know, do a better job of getting the data cleaned up, getting it somewhere where you can either help you from an analytical perspective, 
um, or help you activate capabilities in your company that you aren't currently using uh, in real time. And, and that's kind of how I think about it. You know, it's just the, the data, getting it clean and getting it to a point where you can actually do something with it from a more automated perspective. I'm also wondering how has the adoption of and an attitude towards data science evolved over the last decade and how do you see data science playing a role in the financial industry and uh, financial services today, especially with respect to things like, you know, insurance and self-directed IRAs and alternative investments? Yeah, I think it's everywhere. You know, I, I think I think data science is such a critical thing. And I think the key word for me in data science is science, right? You start with a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, you work to build out something, you measure, you iterate, you know, it's it's all those things. I think there's lots and lots of applications um, of, of using good solid data science in financial services. Um, across both sales and service and customer retention and acquisition. Um, There's just lots of opportunity everywhere. Pricing is another big one where I think data science is completely uh, applicable. But I think, again, it just comes back to having good problems and, and having them well-defined um, to be able to tackle them with sort of the data science uh, toolbox. So what do you see as the, the future of AI and data science and, and analytics broadly looking like, particularly again in financial services world, but and, and how do you see these technologies evolving in the next five to 10 years? You know, it, it, it's, it's a great question. And I don't know that I have the background even, you know, kind of project out five to 10 years. I think, um, you know, you look at the sort of, you, you know, when I was in, college, neural nets and neural net computing was sort of a very theoretical PhD level um, process. And I had a neighbor who worked for NASA and he was working on neural nets and I worked on neural nets in a project early in my career. Um, and they were slow to train and they didn't do what we want them to do. And now they seem to be everywhere. And with graphical computing, um, you know, it seems to be very easy to train up um, and and put into production sort of neural net architectures and different AI architectures. I look at what's happening with sort of the you know the hot topic of the year seems to be Chat GPT and what it can do and what it can't do, and um, and and you just you're sort of seeing this stuff move really you know it's accelerating right. I mean I think there's real acceleration happening within the AI world. Um, you look at um, sort of the ability for AIs to train themselves um, and and really speed the level of training that happens. I mean, I think what it was a couple of years ago, um, the game Go, a computer finally beat a human and they thought that would be sort of the last game to fall. Um, and, and the way they did it was they had two AIs play each other until they got really, really good. So, um, you know, I, I don't even know. I just think it's going to be fascinating. And I think, you know, we're going to be uh, struggling with all sorts of um, questions that span a lot of different areas other than data science as it gets more and more, um, you know, populated in our in our daily environment. How do you, maybe we zoom out just a bit, and how do you see AI data science impacting society as a whole? And then what responsibilities do organizations have to ensure that these technologies are used for the greater good? Yeah, I mean, the, the big one I think about a lot because, you know, you're usually training up your AI or doing some type of training or modeling with the data that you have. And I think, you know, the data that you have usually has bias in it, right? There's usually some bias in the data you have, whether you're aware of whether, whether it's sort of conscious bias or unconscious bias, like there is bias in that data. You only have so many customers, your customers um, may not be representative of what, you know, a broader distribution of people look like. Um, so I just, I think, I think it's sort of incumbent on anybody in this field, the data science field, to really think hard about those types of biases and, and, and maybe expand their education a little bit outside of the technology realm into um, realms like ethics and social impact. And, you know, I'd even say on the outskirts of philosophy, trying to understand um, how what they're doing may have an impact and, and may, you know, sort of have unintended consequences. So what advice then would you give to someone who's interested in pursuing a career in data science? I, I mean, it could be broadly or, you know, particularly in the financial services industry. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I, 
I would give the same advice I've been giving for a while, which is um, there is so much free stuff out there, right? What you can download, you know, great open source tools. There's lots of data sets that you can play with and train with. Um, you know, there are contests out there where people want a better model than they have today. I mean, there's so many different ways to get started and it really, um, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't cost a lot of money to get started if you've got, you know, a laptop and and um, an ability to just sort of get onto the internet. Um, that in itself can be a barrier for some people, um, but I do think that, that we do live in an age where there is some freedom of, um, you know, application relative to when I grew up when it was super expensive. Um, for any, you know, you really need to kind of very specialized things that only corporations had. Um, so I think, you know, the, the opportunities are there for people um, if you want to go try them. Similarly, what advice would you give to other organizations that are just starting, starting down this data driven path? And are there any lessons that, that you've learned along the way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing I, I sort of see over time is I think, um, you know, the, the companies, at least it appears to me that the companies that are leveraging data and, and you know, using data to make better decisions um, seem to be winning. And I think, you know, if, if, if you're not on that path already, you probably need to be on that path. Wonderful insight, John. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Chris. See you.